1991 graduate of UNCG with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. And we're doing this job for other conservation services and activities. Currently, the senior program program. And in addition to doing conservation treatment, we can talk about the data after the program for our training here. He also does uh, workshops for the North Carolina Conservation Consortium. And um, he's a member of the American and the executive board of the Southeast Regional Conservation Association. So uh, please make welcome at John. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Really, I thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come uh, hear the presentation today. I hope that you will find it uh, very interesting. Uh, I would uh, like to start off by thanking uh, Smith Reynolds Library, um, Sharon Snow in particular, for she called me up and asked me if I would come speak today. Um, and this is a subject that I really have taken, we've been very involved in, but have taken a great interest in in uh, the past several years. So it's, it's really a pleasure for me to talk to you all about it. Uh, as you can see, and actually I wonder if we could bring the lights down just a little bit so uh, we can get a little more contrast on the screen. Uh, actually, we, it's, I think there's enough daylight when you take them all out. Okay. Oh, everybody can see fairly well now? Okay, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the, the official title of my, the presentation today is A Massive Undertaking, The Conservation of the North Carolina Museum of Art Audubon. And that is uh, a massive undertaking you know, actually apply to the conservation effort. Uh, it, it has been a lot of work over the past several years, but it also applies just to the sheer size of, of the folios, and I'll certainly be talking about that more later. But it most aptly applies to uh, the work put forth by Audubon to produce the Birds of America. It's, it's really uh, a fascinating story. So I'm actually going to start off today with some historical and some biographical information about Audubon, about that in the 1820s and 1880s. Uh, a brief picture of that of France in North Carolina that's quite interesting. And we do have somebody attending today who actually involved in some of that history. Uh, I, I'll leave, let her remain nameless at the moment, but uh, <laughs> we, I just found that out uh, earlier this afternoon. But, um, that, that was an interesting uh, coincidence today. And then I will give you a of overview of the conservation of the my case have uh, years on the four volumes of, of Audubon's uh, prints. So we'll, we'll have a pretty full afternoon with that. I, if, if I don't ramble on too long, I will try to reserve some time at the end to answer any questions you may have, or certainly do my best to answer them for you. I'm more than happy to do that. I hope that um, you will, will share uh, my interest in the subject today, but I know uh, that when you leave, you'll have a much deeper appreciation for, uh, I think, a remarkable individual and a truly remarkable uh, masterwork. All right. And by the way, this is uh, one of the title pages um, from um, the actual, one of the actual volumes. I think this is the title page from volume three. All right, let's see. You're probably wondering why Napoleon's up there, and that will have, that will actually be very relevant very shortly. Okay. John James Audubon was born in 1785 uh, on the island of Haiti. His father was a French merchant captain. Uh, his mother was the French uh, chambermaid for the family. So he was uh, illegitimate, not very auspicious beginning. And sadly, his biological mother died while he was very young. Uh, but he was adopted right into his father's uh, family and had a fairly happy childhood. The family, when Audubon was still his child, immigrated back to France. And uh, they had gone at a rather turbulent time. Keep in mind, he was born in 1785. The French Revolution had been this is about the time the family goes back. Uh, by 1793, King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette have been beheaded. There's a lot of political, political turmoil, but Audubon's kind of shielded by this. His family is fairly comfortable. They're not right in the thick of things. He has a fairly happy, uh, indulged childhood. Uh, but as he gets older, around you know, 1800, he's uh, 15, uh, he's 
uh, getting about the age uh, to be in the military. And this man, as we all know about the military, Napoleon Bonaparte, and he had his sights set on Europe and conquering Europe. So uh, things were, Audubon's father, I think, was getting a little nervous, A, a about himself going, maybe being conscripted, but certainly about his son. And uh, by 1803, Audubon is 18. He's certainly eligible to be uh, in the military at this point. And Audubon's father uh, decides to purchase some land in the United States and send his son across to manage the property, uh, essentially getting them out of Napoleon's way. Napoleon has his eyes set uh, to the east, eventually towards conquering Russia. And the Audubon is going west to a very expansive United States. Because keep in mind, 1803 is a watershed year because Thomas Jefferson purchases from Napoleon, incidentally, the Louisiana Territory, this huge wide open space, which will actually figure prominently in Audubon's life very shortly. So Audubon, uh, leaving Napoleon behind, comes to the United States. He's a very handsome, bright, articulate 18-year-old full of ideas and energy, uh, not probably terribly well suited to managing a large farm in Pennsylvania, but he tries, but he has his eyes set on other things, primarily uh, a neighbor uh, Miss Lucy Bakewell, who, uh, in fairly short order, he and Lucy marry, uh, and uh, were very much in love by uh, most accounts. And uh, eventually, uh, with the passage of not too many years, they do have a family. And all on, uh, of course, he has a wanderlust. He wants to explore this new this new land. Uh, and he and Lucy set off down the Ohio River, and they go down through the Ohio River Valley, and they end up uh, in northern Kentucky. Homestead there. Uh, Audubon opens a small store, general goods store, and uh, again, uh, following suit in Pennsylvania. He's not the best at running it. He's certainly capable, but he spends most of his time outdoors, exploring, hunting, and drawing. He is never far from his sketchbook. He always has his journal at hand, and in particular, he's drawing birds, and he's a pretty good draftsman, too. Uh, but he and Lucy are happy. They have their young family. They're out there. But by chance, one day, uh, a fellow who, uh, a naturalist who was working on a book of birds comes in and, and to Audubon's store. Audubon sees his drawings and he's thinking to himself, I can do better than this. And the urging of friends and relatives, Audubon eventually wants to uh, develop uh, his own set of, of prints. And he uh, goes to Philadelphia. And he goes to the, the various uh, societies, scientific societies. And he's not exactly part of the establishment. He's sort of a, a frontiersman. I'm sure he has, a, he speaks very good English, but I'm sure he has a pronounced French accent. He has long hair. He's wearing, uh, well, he, perhaps not buckskin at this point. He, he does, uh, have quite a taste for clothes. But uh, he, he wasn't really fitting in with, I, I think, what the establishment at that time was looking for in a naturalist. Plus, he had no real naturalist credentials other than the fact that he was a, a fairly good draftsman. He was turned down. He was disappointed. Uh, but he realized after returning home, and that was to travel to Europe, to travel to and see if he could get his dream realized there. So, in 1820, for Liverpool, uh, and he knows no one. I think he really knows a lot of fear. I mean, he does have some hesitation, some self doubt. He likes his journal, but he proceeds ahead. And the only thing he has is a letter of introduction to the Rathbone family. In he's never met them, but uh, he will. So he gets to Liverpool. He meets the Rathbones, and fortunately for Audubon, he is very charming. And Rathbones uh, warmly embrace. Uh, a picture of making the land. Realize that you have to do a lot of work to, to get this dream. It's a community. Uh, he's got to find some financial backing for this. And so he starts the rounds. Uh, and I could make a whole presentation of his, his, those few months uh, in the fall of. 1826, but I'll condense it quite a bit. Audubon eventually ends up in Edinburgh, Scotland, which at that time was the center of enlightenment, of learning. 
and he meets several prominent people, and he's getting closer and closer, still not quite uh, getting everything. Uh, a gentleman, uh, several gentlemen, but one in particular, a uh, Mr. William Holm Lazars, who is the preeminent uh, engraver in Edinburgh. He meets Mr. Lazars, and uh, it's a cold, rainy October afternoon. I, th I was just looking in one of the, uh, the transcript of his journal, October 31st. And Edinburgh in October is, is not the cheeriest climate. But they're walking, they're sharing an umbrella, and, and Lazars is chatting all about the other naturalist he's working for at the moment. And Audubon really doesn't want to hear any of this, but they go up to, Lazar's, uh, up to Audubon's room where he has his portfolio. He sits Mr. Lazars down, and he unbuckles the straps, and he opens up his portfolio, and Audubon's drawings are life-size. They're big. And there's a lot of big birds in the United States, by the way. Uh, we'll, we'll see some of them very shortly. And he opens up his portfolio, and he pulls out some of the drawings. And I think one drawing that he, he pulls out is it, 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 of uh, some birds of prey, maybe some hawks tearing at a, a rabbit or some other small animal. It's very dramatic. Uh, and Lazars is literally left speechless for a couple minutes. And then he jumps up, he's ecstatic, and he says, we've got to do this project. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I could read it directly, but... Um, so Audubon realizes he's, he's on to something at this point. So Lazars is very enthusiastic about it, and things really start uh, going in Audubon's favor. Um, this portrait of Audubon was painted right in this time, in late 1826, um, by the artist John Syme, because Audubon is suddenly becoming, becoming uh, very celebrated in the area. He's finally meeting the right people. People are sort of signing on to this uh, project. And when I say signing on, Audubon and actually sell subscriptions so that uh, people would subscribe to receive plates and then uh, that would fund the product. Uh, but the initial plan, at least as far as Audubon was concerned, was that he would fund the first five, self-fund those, and then you really use that as his calling card to enlist support for the rest of the project. And I'll talk a little bit later about exactly what the scope of that project was uh, initially and what it ended up being. So, uh, as you can see in this portrait, Audubon looks uh, he looks kind of manic there, actually. He sort of has a, a gleam, in his fevered gleam in his eye. And I think that's probably a, a very realistic depiction. It really was a heady time for him, and he really was sort of the, that manic type of personality. He was very enthusiastic. Uh, and you can see he's in his very um, uh, frontiers type garb, which played well in Europe. Uh, Benjamin Franklin had done it uh, several years before. He, frontiersman by any means, but he, he played that off to great success in France and England. And I think that sort of worked for Audubon too, and he played that up. So uh, things are going well. Um, it's now November 1826, and around oh, the 10th or so, uh, Lazars begins engraving the first copper plate. And by the end of the month, around the 28th, uh, he shows Audubon the first proof. Of let's see, that's uh, that's actually not the first one. Let's go back. Let's there. That's the one we want. Um, the American Wild Turkey. Now the image you see there is pretty close to life size. The actual size of the print. It is about uh, 38 inches tall. It's a and the Wild Turkey. If you ever see one up there, they're big. They look a lot smaller when they're in the grocery store in the little plastic <laughs> bag. But they are very, they're very big birds, and they're very fast. And uh, this was the very first one that Lazars did. Um, Audubon was thrilled, and the project was off and running for a few months. Uh, unfortunately, by the time we get into mid-1827, uh, Lazars' colorists decide they want to go on strike for higher wages. And uh, without going to a lot of detail, you had the engraver, but then he had a whole room full of colorists, and each one would specialize in coloring a particular, hand coloring with watercolor, a particular area of the print. Um, it was very detailed work and very precise work. And uh, unfortunately, since Audubon did not well here and did not have deep pockets and was self funding this, he got a little concerned because he knew he couldn't afford uh, to pay the higher wages, and he knew he had to go to Plan B, which was to go south to London, find another engraver.